Acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional custodians of the land on which we worship, work and meet, the Bundjalung people. We recognise the significant role of their forgiveness. So a very warm welcome to you who are joining us when we are in an awkward empty trying to do a broad, a live broadcast in an empty church to know that the church is in fact the people. And again, we're all here, but God comes to your home. So let us pray. Jesus, by your example, you challenge us to make this season a journey of discovery. As we leave comforting landmarks behind to inhabit and explore our own uncharted places, help us to discern who we are and embrace what we might become. Jesus, by your words and actions, you show us how to watch and wait and wrestle. As we listen to familiar stories and savour afresh your wit and wisdom, help us to recognise where we are and envisage where his close friends Mary and Martha grapple with his death. You'll find a download for this liturgy from our website.
11, verses 1 to 44. A man named Lazarus, who lived in Bethany, was ill. Bethany was the town where Mary and her sister Martha lived. This Mary was the one who poured the perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped them with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was ill. The sisters sent Jesus a message. Lord, your dear friend is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, The final result of this illness will not be the death of Jesus. This has happened in order to bring glory to God, and it will be the means by which the Son of God will receive glory. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he received the news that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to the disciples, let us go back to Judea. Teacher, the disciples answered, just a short time ago, the people there wanted to stone you, and are you planning to go back? Jesus said, a day has 12 hours, hasn't it? So whoever walks in broad daylight does not stumble for they see the light of this world. But if they walk during the night, they stumble because they have no light. Jesus said this and then added, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I will go and wake him up. The disciples answered, If he is asleep, Lord, he will get well. Jesus meant that Lazarus had died, but they thought he meant natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, but for your sake I am glad that I was not with him, so that you will believe. Let us go to him. Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us all go with the teacher, so that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had been buried four days before. Bethany was less than three kilometres from Jerusalem and many Judeans had come to see Martha and Mary to comfort them over their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, Mary stayed in the house. Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, Lord, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you are asking for brother will rise to life, Jesus told him. I know, she replied, that he will rise to life on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. And all those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answered. I do believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After Martha said this, she went back and called her sister Mary privately. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up and hurried out to meet him. Jesus had not yet arrived in the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The people who were in the house with Mary comforting her, followed her when they saw her get up and hurry out. They thought that she was going to the grave to weep there. Mary arrived where Jesus was, and as soon as she saw him, she fell at his feet. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not ha have died. Jesus saw her weeping, and he saw how the people who were with her were weeping also. His heart was touched, and he was deeply moved. Where have you buried him? He asked them. Come and see, Lord, they answered. Jesus wept. See how much he loved them, the people said. But some of them said, He gave sight to the blind man, didn't he? Could he not have kept Lazarus from dying? Deeply moved once more, Jesus went to the tomb, which was a cave with a stone placed at the entrance. Take the stone away, Jesus ordered. Martha, the dead man's sister, answered, there will be a bad smell, Lord. He has been buried for four days. Jesus said to her, Didn't I tell you that you would see God's glory if you believed? 
They took the stone away. Jesus looked up and said, I thank you, Father, that you listened to me. I know that you will always listen to me. But I say this for the sake of the people here, so that they will believe that you sent me. After he had said this, he called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He came out, his hands and feet wrapped in bow. This is the Gospel of the Lord. First week of Lent, we actually have two stories about death. In the Gospel, you have just heard with a stone or with bandages, Jesus asks that the stone be rolled away. So Jesus goes to the place of death. An equally long reading comes from the, which is the Old Testament, and it's a story by Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a prophet, and he's been with God's people during a really rough period of their history. They've been overtaken by other nations, armies have come in, uh, taken some of them into prison and devastated the land. It's the time of the, the Babylonian conquest. And he's taken in a vision to the and valley are piles and piles of dry bones. I think these were the bones of soldiers that had fought on Israel's behalf to keep the Babylonians away. And in this vision, the Lord asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? And you hear this really tired, deep sigh from Ezekiel. And he says, Lord, only you know. at the reading from the Old Testament and the reading from the New Testament, our invitation in this fifth week of Lent is to do something counter-cultural. This week we are to go to a place of death. Perhaps you may think that death is the opposite of life and a place where God may not be found. But we are to go to the place of death, both in and without, and recognise God's presence there. I was trained for the ministry and the theologians that taught us best to prepare us to go to the place of death. It is a priestly calling to go to the place of death, and it's a calling that I share with you today. People will phone and say, a loved one has just died, please can you come? People will phone and say, my has ended, please can you come? And so as priests are called to go to the place of death, each of us, baptised in the priesthood of all believers, is called to go to the place of death. And how are we to do that? How are we to believe that? What do we do to go to the place of death? The answer to that question is that there is really nothing to do. It's more a state of being rather than of doing. And we can come to this conclusion through how we analyse the text. You see, in the first part of John's Gospel, the first part of John's Gospel, chapters 1 to 12, there are seven miracles or seven signs that the writer describes Jesus. There's the, the healing of the man born blind, there's Jesus walking on the water, and here in John chapter 11, we have the seventh miracle, the seventh sign where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. These seven signs correlate with 
seven signs that happen in the second book of John's Gospel, which is John chapter 13 to the end. The sixth sign in John's Gospel is when Jesus is crucified and placed on the cross. Caesar will say, Behold, On the seventh day in John's gospel, Jesus is placed in the empty tomb. Immediately when you hear these seven signs or these seven events, you, you may be reminded of the story in Genesis where the world is created in seven days. And there's a direct correlation because on the sixth day, according to Genesis 1, God creates humankind, and on the seventh day, God rests. So in Genesis, God rests on the seventh day, and in John's Gospel, Jesus, the Christ, God in flesh, rests in the tomb on the seventh day. And so as we encounter the seventh sign, where Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and we are called to go to the place of the dead. We do what God did in Genesis, and we do what Jesus did, having died on the cross. We rest. We rest in the tomb with Jesus on the seventh day. We rest in God with God. Notice what the text doesn't say. The text doesn't say if you do A, B, and C, you will get the resurrection. The text doesn't say if we believe in Jesus that he's the way, the truth, and the life, we will get resurrection or eternal life in the last days. It's part of the correction that Jesus offers Martha. Jesus says instead, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. And so resurrection and life is not some reward for good behaviour. Resurrection and life is a person. It is Jesus the Christ. And as we learn to rest in the presence of God, which is found deep within us as our truest selves, we have all we need to go to the place of death. And so I'm imagining how we might be going to the place of death in the weeks ahead of us as our Lenten journey draws to an end. We go to the place of death within. And maybe some are, are facing the end of employment. And so you are sitting jobless, maybe queuing up at Centrelink, and you say, <sighs> Can these bones live? Or you say with Mary and Martha, if you had been here, Lord, then. Perhaps in the weeks ahead, loved ones will become ill and may even die. And then we go to the place of death. And with the prophet, we might hear the words, can these bones live? Or we might hear, if you had been here, Lord, then. And perhaps as we move from lockdown or shutdown into lockdown, and we are caged in the home, perhaps for some of us, home is not a safe place. Perhaps there's tension in the relationships in the home. And as you sit stuck in the home, in the midst of aggravating relationships. Maybe we're going to the place of death. <sighs> Can these bones live? If you had been here, Lord, then. And so we face death in our connection with Jesus the Christ. As we rest in the tomb, we are deeply connected with the divine. The divine is deep within us as our truest self. And as we connect more and more with Jesus, we have all the divine resources necessary 
to face death, for it is through death that resurrection and life comes. For some of us, we go to the place of death beyond our inner journeys. Going to the place of death is something Jesus did when he came close to those who were ill, when he came close to those members of society that others rejected. And likewise, for centuries, the church has drawn close to the place of death, coming close to widows and orphans and announcing with Jesus, Lazarus, come out, roll back the stone, set them free. This week, one of my parishioners came to see me and suggested that members of our church set up a, a food store outside Centrelink to at least offer food and water to the many queuing outside the Centrelink office. And this is precisely what is happening. This person heard the call to go to a place of death where there is suffering and anxiety and worry for the future and to announce with Jesus, unbind them, set them free. So in this, fine, in this fifth week of Lent, as our journey to Easter draws closer, I invite you to rest within yourself, to rest in God, to surrender to God, and to receive the resurrected life that is already within you as your truest identity and your truest self, and to allow that to be the blessing that breathes new life into dry bones. One of the ways we go to the place of death is to, is to pray. And in prayer, we encounter the death of our false selves, of our ego. We let go of self-interest. We allow self-interest to die. And in prayer, we draw close to those who are suffering and allow our prayers to be the voice of Jesus that says, unbind them, set them free. So let us pray. God of all, in these unnerving times, we look to you for our stability, orientation, and meaning. We remember your steadfast love for your people, your will that all should live. In the midst of chaos and death, help us to hear your voice. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We hold before you all who have died this week, we remember those who have succumbed to the coronavirus and whose families are stricken with shock and grief. We remember those who have died from other causes, from famine, from war, 
or from domestic violence, accident and illness. In the midst of chaos and death, help your people trust your goodness. Help us to know your love and life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We hold before you all who are far from home, those trapped by the closure of borders and ports and cancelled flights. We pray for those whose livelihoods have collapsed, whether temporarily or permanently, those whose sense of a future is suddenly fragile and fearful, those who fear eviction and debt, and those who will struggle to eat. We pray for an outbreak of radical solidarity, a remembering of mutual belonging and of fellowship in frailty. In the midst of chaos and death, help your people trust your goodness Help us know your love and life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We hold before you all who seek to sustain or care for the lives of others, all who bring life and hope. We remember those working in essential services, medical staff, shopkeepers, school teachers, public servants, political leaders, transport and waste disposal workers. We remember parents coping with added strain and those caring for the elderly. We pray that kindness and compassion may shape our life together. In the midst of chaos and death, help your people trust your goodness. Help us to know your life and love. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. We remember those whose urgent needs are not being met 
because of the current crisis. We think of those whose homes were lost in the bushfires, the forests and landscapes awaiting regeneration, those waiting on surgery or for justice. We hold before you those for whom isolation and lack of distraction provoke anxiety, depression or anger and acknowledge our own struggles with these times. Transform our loneliness to solitude. Transform our anxiety to trust. Transform our boredom to gratitude and our dying to life. In the midst of chaos and death, help your people trust your goodness. Help us know your love and life. you for being with us and praying with us this morning. If you go to our website anglicans.live there is information on resources for your spiritual journey during the months that lie ahead. From tomorrow we launch our virtual hermitage. The hermitage is a place where hermits live. Hermits are those who choose to seclude themselves from society in order to encounter God more deeply. And so we're asking that God convert our enforced isolation into solitude with God. For our virtual hermitage, we'll be praying together every morning at 10 a.m. And we'll be doing that examine at 8 p.m. If you'd like to join me, I'll be on Facebook at 10 a.m. And if you'd like to, please download the Pray As You Go app available from Android and Apple stores. This will be the structure and the guide for our prayers at 10 a.m. concludes with a final prayer and a blessing and our final hymn is O oh, for a Thousand to Sing. God has called us to journey for a season through the wilderness places. And so, as Jesus did before us, we will set out once more to wander in an uncomfortable landscape and wrestle with its challenges, that through the tempering action of the Spirit, may emerge ready to do the work of the kingdom. And now may the love of the faithful creator, the peace of the wounded healer, and the holy challenging spirit, the hope
Exactly.